Welcome back to Empowered. I'm Elizabeth Namofsky. The future of fertility treatment funding is today's topic. So, sorry, Laura, you were talking about Simel Jane. Please, please continue. Yeah, my t- so two co-founders of Flora, myself, Dr. Christy Lane, and Somal Jane. And, and Somal is uh, based in the New York area. He was the chief actuary at um, some major digital insurance companies. And we were fortunate to meet him through our work with InsureTech New York. And he was just so um, instrumental to everything we were doing that he came on as a third co-founder. So it's really interesting the way the three of us came together, not knowing each other a couple of years ago. We were all just trying to tackle the same problem or thinking about it. And I find it um, quite serendipitous the way different people can come into your life and you can end up being business partners with them and truly building something, um, hopefully industry and life changing. So, you know, life changing. Yes. What does the next year and five years look like for fertility insurance and basically the fertility landscape in general? Yeah. So over the next five years, um, it, it's possible that the demand for fertility treatment will go up. We, we likely anticipate that. Fortunately, there's starting to be a little bit more supply in terms of providers, particularly in the U.S. Again, this is a very hot topic in the in the venture capital space, and so we're getting a lot of funding towards it. The good news is the science is often getting better, so we can get more successful outcomes with treatments. And in terms of the sort of insurance landscape, uh, we do anticipate that there should be more coverage, whether it's through group coverage, whether it's through individual coverage like our own, to hopefully make it more affordable for all of us to be able to build our families and really have, I guess, the fulfillment that I was fortunate to have in in building mine. So you talked about the United States. How is your model impacted by the reproductive health and IVF debates in the United States? For example, the challenge to IVF rights in, in, let's say, Alabama. Yeah, well, it's it's certainly been something we have to monitor. It's certainly been concerning. While we are based in Canada and my, some of my partners are in the U.S., the U.S. is is a very target market. It's, it's our primary market. And so what I will say about our model that is slightly unique is that in terms of coverage, we really cover the clinical path. And that starts from diagnostics to medication to IUI to IVF. So it is very concerning that there are restrictions in those states, but there's a lot of coverage that can come before that and hopefully success. Generally, you can have 80 to 90 percent of people be successful even pre-IVF. But those who do still need IVF with our type of coverage, they could move to another state and use their coverage there. So um, we're really trying to still make it accessible and hopefully where there are barriers, give you other options. So your focus is fertility insurance. Um, is Flora looking at expanding into other women's health markets or products? Well, absolutely. I, if you are if you are having a baby when you're you know approaching forty years old or in your forties, you're you're probably in perimenopause at the same time, and so that is also an underserved market, right? When we get into perimenopause and menopause, there's still a lot of treatments and expenses that are borne out of pocket by women. By creating this community, again, looking at insurance as community, we're creating dollars to fund those underserved markets. So really, our our goal is to look at reproductive health across the spectrum: pre-fertility, having kids, and post-fertility, and into and menopause. So it's important that we create funding for those areas. So as a female founded business, um, and you're focused on women's health, uh, I know that a lot of females are having problems um, fundraising, having people coming in and investing in their companies. How has fundraising been for you? I'll say it has, it's going well. Um, it's true that most venture capital dollars, very little go to female founders. And I think there's also the challenge that it's it's hard to be a female founder. Mm-hmm. You're taking on the caregiving role so often that to, and then to build a business, you need sufficient capital to just have, you know, $10,000 given to you, you can't do much with that. And so I'd say there's more and more venture capital firms that are looking to invest in female founders, to underserved founders. Um, For us, we're in a great space. So choose your market wisely. Be very passionate about what you're building. We're oversubscribed on our rounds. So that's, you know, that's fantastic. But it takes opening, 
we've had hundreds and hundreds of phone calls with VCs and angels. So you just, you have to be having those calls nonstop and you will, you will never stop fundraising, but you need that capital to properly grow your business. So when we come back, we will still talk about uh, fertility insurance and uh, other tips. So don't go away.